promised you that I was going to tell you some real, real life uh, miracles which I've experienced in terms of healing through trust in God. But if I have time, I'll tell you. But if I don't come tomorrow, I'll definitely tell you. Because tomorrow I'm not talking. At the end, I, I would like to ask if you have any questions. Uh, I can then try to answer them tomorrow. So if you have some piece of paper where you want to write a piece of a question, you can always give me at the end of the, um, of the session. And then tomorrow, I won't be talking like this. We will be answering those questions. Uh, and then if I've got time, I'll tell you some real, real life experiences. So today we're going to talk about um, 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 trust in God. Now, as I, we have gone through the um, eight principles of uh, creation health, we've almost come to the fifth one now, which is trust in God. We've gone through um, a choice, we've gone through uh, rest, we've gone through environment, we've gone through activity, and tonight we are on uh, trust in God. Now, you remember very well, if anybody has ever gone into an operating theatre or to any hospital, and you're going to undergo a a surgery, an operation. You know very well that you know the doctor explains to you that the operation is going to go like this, like this. And the first thing which is to happen is that you have to have trust in that doctor. Otherwise, you wouldn't allow him to put a knife onto your tummy or onto your chest, onto your brain. You just have to have trust. And God is asking us to have trust in Him because from the beginning, during the time of creation, God instructed uh, Adam and Eve that they had to obey. And in obeying, they had to trust that God was going to do everything. In fact, why did God tell them, don't eat of this tree? It, God wanted to demonstrate whether they trusted him or not trusted him. And so tonight, well, tonight we're going to look at some few slides which are going to show us that if you look at the Psalms 92 verse 12, it will tell you something about trusting in God. Abandoning everything else and trusting in God. Trusting in God will bear some fruit in you and that fruit will lead you to have good choice in terms of what we have said before in terms of noticing, prioritizing and acting. And the next thing what happens you have got fruit of rest which we have discussed already. And then you have fruit of good environment, engaging yourself, making sure that you are living in a good environment. And of course, you will participate in mental and physical health. And of course, the fruit of continuing to grow in the trust of God. But this will lead you to have good interrelationship with others, with very optimistic uh, uh, look outlook to, to the world and to other people. And in the end, you will have trust in what God has given us as good nutrition on this earth. Now, God is the originator of love. No one can claim that his love is coming from himself. It is originating from God. And God is the one who loved us first. And so we know very well that love heals wounds. If no one shows you love, that wound won't heal. It may be an emotional wound. It may be a physical wound. Imagine if your husband has been unfaithful to you and he has caused a scar onto your heart, a wound onto your heart. He has to apologize. He has to recognize that he has hurt you. And he has to recognize that he has to hurt also while you are hurting. And it is only when he has demonstrated that love that a wound can heal. And we know very well love promotes health. You know, the Bible is very, very clear. A cheerful person is good medicine to the heart. It means there is love which is abound in that person. And God instructs that we must not give conditional love, but we must give unconditional love to our spouses, to our friends, and to everybody else. I always tell my wife that I am not unfaithful because I'm afraid of you. I am faithful to God because I love my God. You are only enjoying the benefits of my love for my God. Because I give unconditional love to my God. And if everybody could have that, <laughs> I think that challenge. But I always tell her that she enjoyed, and I'm very, very sure I'm not faith, unfaithful to her, to, to, to my God in terms of that. And she just enjoys the outshoots or the, 
uh, consequences of it. Whatever it is, uh, which springs out of that, yes, she knows that she enjoys that. So we should have unconditional love, and it is one of the most powerful tools you can have in life. Now, recipients of love, people who receive love, first of all, imagine your child when he's being born. That child can recognize this is my mother. This is not my mother. And to start to cry. Why? It's because there is love which flows from that mother to, to that child. I'll explain to you later why it is like that. But we have seen that those people who receive, who are recipients of love, who are well loved, they have got very low risk of heart disease. They have increased the immunoglobin now. Immunoglobin is a soldier in our blood. Each one of us has got a soldier called immunoglobin A. That one is the one which fights infection as soon as infection gets into you, either through the mouth, through the nose, or whatever, through some cut or some sort. That immunoglobin is the one which fights infection. And we know those people who are loved well will have a high uh, immunoglobin in their bodies. And we have seen those people who are loved. They have got no beats. Heartbeats which go pam, 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 pam. They go pam, pam. Heartbeats which are smooth which are not irregular, because they never panic, they are never stressed, they don't have any palpitations, because they have nothing to worry about, because they are loved. Now, lack of love, we found that it causes a lot of psychological disturbances. In fact, we have seen that many people who are murderers, proper murderers, they have never been loved. If you look at their childhood life, they have never been loved. Either they grew up in a divorced home or parents were always fighting and we've seen that they've got something wrong with their brains. And some of these have got suicidal tendencies. They tend to want to kill themselves because they've never been loved. Now John 10 verse 10 is a very, very popular verse which is uh, well known to everybody. But I like the last part. That you may have, uh, you may have life and leave it abundantly. Abundant means with more satisfaction, with a lot of love, you are actually very, very satisfied, satisfied with your life. Now, strength in God actually has got a lot of positive impacts on our lives. It is reduces stress uh, depressive symptoms in us. It, is, it increases satisfaction with life. It reduces length of hospital stay. And it also reduces the risk of alcohol abuse. This has been seen and, uh, and, 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 and tested everywhere. Now, there's a way that I want you to take home today, which is cognitive dissonance. Did you hear what I said? Cogn it's a very difficult word, yeah? Cognitive dissonance. Now, this is a very important word I want you to take home. It describes those people who preach, don't commit adultery. And yet they've got six girlfriends. They are living what they don't preach. Are you following me? They live a different life from what they preach. Don't steal, and yet they are thieves. They've got cognitive dissonance. Remember this word. Now, that cognitive dissonance, develops because they have no trust in their God. They, don't, they lack trust. They lack love, the source of love. Now, time spent with God is worthwhile spent. But I've seen in hospitals that the most miserable patients are the ones who don't have relatives who come to visit them. She remember, why didn't you come to see me? Yes, I came in the morning, but I expected you to come in the afternoon. But I only come once. He says, but there's no one who comes to see me. So they expect me now. I'm now their relative. And so I'm expected to come during all those visiting hours. We need to visit other people. To give them love. Especially those who deserve our love. You know, there's a song we sing in our seventh day Adventist church. I love the prayers of those who I love. This is very, very important in our lives. Because like people who are visited mostly in hospital by many, many visitors, we know they heal faster. I know St. Anne's uh, Avenue, St. Paranyatwa, is only allowed two visitors. But also there are 
lacking in this kind of data to prevent infection. But we know people who are visited by many people heal faster than those who are not being visited at all. Now, I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking to you about this hormone, which is a miracle hormone, which is called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is the basis of trust. It is known as the hormone for bonding. It is known as a hormone for bonding. Yeah? I'll tell you, I need to come, and I'll show you where it comes. Now, Oxytocin has been known as a miracle hormone. A hormone which is amazing, the most amazing molecule in the whole world. Hakuna molecule in all say oxytocin. When I started medical school, we were taught that oxytocin is the only one used when uh, is one secreted when a woman is giving birth. And some of them we used to put it in a drip so that they give birth faster and just deliver a child push you and child comes out <laughs> now this hormone is very easy to get and it is gotten by many ways did you know that if you hug your wife you get a lot of oxytocin release if you look at her in the morning in the bedroom you get a lot of hormone release. If you shake her, you touch a hand, or touch a hair, a lot of oxytocin is released. So those who are sitting next to their wives, can you touch your wives? We want hormones to be released. <laughs> but you don't touch, cross your hands. You touch with the hand next to her. <laughs> and keep touching her throughout my talk. We want you to we get over flooded, saturated with this oxytocin. Did you know what Pastor was saying last night? Is that emotional infidelity it is as a result of oxytocin. Did you know it? Because you know what? You look at the lady in the morning and she realizes that you're looking at her, oxytocin is released. There are other hormones called pheromones. Did you know them? Pheromones are then the ones you don't, even if I look at you, if you don't like me, because you don't have like pheromones. If you like me in your heart, I know you can't tell me. But if there is a, a pheromone which is going between you and me, it will be there. These are hormones which are God created. But tonight, I want to emphasize on this oxytocin. It is gotten by just a handshake. Just sharing eyesight is very, very important. And I'll tell you later on. A love portion that is built right in our bodies. Because it is this hormone, after being intimate with your wife, it is the one which, released, which is released in greatest abundance. I'm sure the wives have been very disappointed after they have had intimate with their husbands. The husbands just go, oh, oh, oh. It's because they have released a lot of oxygen. Then they go to bed immediately. You need to wake them up. Otherwise, they just go and they, it gives you, sends them into a deep sleep. Remember when we were talking about rest? The third and fourth stage of sleep. And you can't even wake them up because oxytocin has been released. It is a love portion that is built right in. It, is, it helps moms to become mom. You know, when a baby is born, she starts suckling from the breast. Oxytocin is released. And then they share eyesight. The baby looks at the mother, the mother looks at the baby. The baby looks at the mother, oxytocin is released in the baby, oxytocin is released in the mother. We have seen that fathers who lose their wives, say, during uh, immediate postpartum, and they take care of the babies. Did you know that the babies get clung to those fathers just as if they are clung to their mothers? It's because the father now starts looking at the baby, the baby looks at the father. The baby looks and doesn't differentiate this is a female face, this is a male face. It just knows this is the face which my first oxytocin was released. And she recognized this oxytocin, nobody can understand this molecule. 
it reduces social fears. It is the one which, when you are in a group, and you like that group, the in-group, when you like that group, oxytocin is released. When you don't like that group, oxytocin is not released. And then you don't like them. Are you following me? So, it is a very, very important hormone in that it builds our social self. Now, healing and pain relief. We know very well that this woman has been very, very useful in terms of healing and pain relief. Now, let me tell you, I've been also married for 20, 30 years now. And there are some headaches which are complained of. You know that, Father? There are headaches. Now, I just want to tell the men, what you need to do is to look at your wife. Touch her. The oxytocin will be released and the oxytocin will heal the headache. And everything is done. So the healing is very, very good from oxytocin. Is my time up? It is a diet aid. We know very well it increases the appetite in certain circumstances. So it's a very, very good uh, diet uh, aid. It's an antidepressant. It releases stress. I'm just going a little bit faster because I think she wants me to go away from here. But this one about generosity. There are some people who if they shake somebody and say, I want something, they will immediately give hundred dollars. They have got high amounts of oxytocin. And some people, they, you ask them, they don't give anything. Very low levels of oxytocin in their brain. So know that those who are generous is because of this hormone called oxytocin. It is the hormone which makes us human beings. It makes us interact. It makes us all others being social beings, being social to others. You see, as the people are coming, they are looking at them. I can see my minister here is looking at these people. And obvious, there is a bond which is already starting to form. Recognizing, I've seen this man sometime. And recognizing that bond is because oxytocin is released. I hope everybody has learned about oxytocin. I hope you start using it to the benefit of all your spouses. And don't use it unnecessarily in an unholy way in the offices. God has given us this hormone to use it wisely. Make a good choice and use it wisely. May God bless us. This evening. Every friend in Lord's battles to our call Bless your plans, is your heart so heavy laden? Do you feel the lost command? Do you feel that no one loves you and there's no use to try? Just bring your case to Jesus, your whole soul, you satisfy me. The broken pieces and bring them to the Lord. Pick up the broken pieces, trust in His holy word. He will put them back together and make your life complete. Just place your broken pieces and the same. Okay.
the hands of those who are happy to be here. Take that hand and shake the hand of someone next to you, to the left, to the right, in front of you, behind you. Just welcome them to the house of the Lord. We are today on day number five, day number five of our revival. We are nearing the end of our revival. We're nearing the end of our revival. Anyone who says I've received a blessing this week, just raise up your hand. Amen. Amen. I have also been truly blessed. As always, we've got a gift. Uh, we have promised to give away a gift every night for one who invites the highest number of visitors who are here for the first time. Um, highest number of visitors who are here for the first time. We've got a record of seven so far. A record of seven. We're st here. We still need to beat a record of 40, but let's work with seven today. Anyone we invited seven who are here for the first time? Uh, six, five, ooh, oh, how, how many? Five. Okay. Anyone we invited five who are here for the first time? Um, who are invited, um, what is the other number? Four. Four. <laughs> four and a half. <laughs> um, we have got four. Would, would, would you like to stand with your four? I mean, we just want uh, to satisfy our auditors that indeed. Okay, let's clap hands for him. If you can come forward and get your Bible. Come forward. The one who invited them all, can, you can come and get a Bible. That's a great and important task that you've done. Let's clap hands for him one more time. God bless you. God bless you. Um, uh, I've got also a number booklet in one you invited. Three. Three were here for the first time. Three. Three. All right. Okay. Uh, would you like to stand with your three people? Wow. You know what? I'm thinking. You can come and get a book. But I'm changing my mind. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a Bible. I owe you a Bible. Three is a big task. I don't know how much money you paid to bribe them to come, but... <laughs> Um, so I'll get, you, I'll get you a Bible, I'll get you a Bible, I'll get you a Bible tomorrow. Um, uh, two, right, there's one, two, okay, all right, you can all come and get your Bible. Oh, let's see the evidence before we, all right, let's clap hands for them. You can come and get your book, if you can give them to your visitors. All right. Okay, so we move on to uh, I feel like giving you also one. Let's clap hands for him. Um, let's move on to the first part of our service this evening which, which we deal with issues of family. We've already said you can find uh, our transcripts there and also you can contact us on our website. And we move on to the area of family life, which is our mini seminar on family life. Today we're talking about family finances, family finances. Some 
writer says it is one of the biggest uh, marriage killers, uh, issues around finances that they affect um, our families in a big way. So we're going to look at just again, just a small section of that presentation. We have promised that on Saturday we'll have more time to address full seminars on uh, marriage, but during the week we're just giving just little snippets. Um, principles for managing finances, family finances. Okay, just going to look briefly through though. The first one, trust God to meet your needs. One thing that we need to realize as families, we need to realize that God is the supplier of all our needs. God has promised to provide our daily bread and we must trust him that he is able to supply all our needs. So the first thing in managing family finances is an understanding that we do not, we are not the source, but God is the source who supplies all our needs. Now, one of the challenges that we have is to, is failure to realize that if I am the man in the house and I'm the breadwinner and the wife is the bread baker. Now, <laughs> and if I am the, uh, I am the breadwinner, um, God just used me as a channel. I am not the source. It's not my money. I'm just the source to supply the family. God uses me as a channel. I'm not the source. I'm just a channel by which he supplies the, whatever the needs for the family. But God at the other end, he is the one who is the source. And he can take care of the family with or without me. He can take care of the family using me as a channel, using the wife as a channel. But we must realize we're not the source. Because many of us, we grew up in families where two of our fathers were abusive financially. You know, remember back in the day when the trousers used to have a little thing here um, where they used to put the money, we call it a tailor, whatever it used to be called. And the mother would come and ask for money and the father would turn around <laughs> because she must never see how much remains. You get the money for bread. But it is, that is not how it's supposed to be. As a husband, I must realize that God is, I'm just being used as a channel. I'm not the source. The problem with being abusive for the men who are abusive financially is that the marriage life is long. You know, marriage life is long. And God has got a sense of humor. One day he might decide to switch off this channel. You know, if I, the one who is the source, and my wife has to come to beg, I need money for this, I need money for this, I need money for this, and I'm abusive financially. God, in his own way, he can switch off this channel. And when he switches off, he opens up the wife's channel now. And now, because I have set the rules that in this home, whoever is the, who brings the money is the king, and the other one must beg. So that means now, I must go to the wife and say, hey, can I have a 10 rand for, 100 rand for petrol, can I have, and I must come and beg. Whereas, if as the channel, I, every month I say to my wife, there it is, what do we need to do? What needs to be bought? What are the priorities? When God has switched off my channel, then my wife already knows that now that she works, that's the same thing. When whoever brings has the money, let's put it down so that we can all share together. Are we all together? So God is the source. We are just channels. We are not the source. Um, God is the source who supplies our needs. Secondly, set long-term financial goals as a family. As a family, have let us not just run around in second. Let's have long-term goals. What do we want to do financially as a family? It might be to get out of debt. It might be to buy a house. It might be to move to another area. It might be to build a holiday home. Whatever it is, let's have long-term financial goals that we agree upon as a family. We sit down and say, this is our goal. This is our vision. So that every month, whatever we are doing, we, that goal keeps us motivated. That goal makes us our thinking. So that even when we save, we know what we are trying to do in the future. Every family must have long-term financial goals of what we are trying to do with money. 
Number three, give God his share. Right? Maybe it was supposed to be number one. But give God his share. Um, it is important to realize that God is the owner. To acknowledge God as the owner of everything that we have. And 10% the tithe, it shows, it's an acknowledgement that God, you are the owner of everything that I have. And every month, before you spend the rest of it, take that that belongs to God, give it back to him and says, the strength that I had this month, uh, the health that I had, it's all because of you. I acknowledge who you are in my life and in my marriage. And when we do that, God blesses the rest. In fact, 90% with God goes much further than 100% without God. That car that was supposed to have a breakdown of a gearbox after 20,000 kilometers, God just extends it. He says, no, this one is a faithful. He extends it to 40,000. That engine that was supposed to be messed up, God blesses. That health. You know, sometimes we steal God for money and the children just become sick, all of them, one by one. God blesses those who prioritize Him. It helps to trust in God instead of stealing. I'm saying even to those who, who might not be going to church, even if you don't go to church, make sure you don't steal the tithe. Every week, every month, stop by a church and give the tithe and go back to whatever you want to do. But don't steal the tithe from God. You will be blessed even in that regard. Um, number three, number four, establish a budget and live within those means. Establish a budget. The issue is that prioritize. Start with the things that are important. Start with the order of the things that needs to be paid. And budget. And what is more important, it's not just creating a budget. It's at the end of the month, come back and look and say, have we lived according to that budget? Have we, have, is our expenditure in line with how our budgeting has been? And if it is not, let's correct, let's redress, let's address the situation. So create a budget, live within, with, within your means. Individual expenditure might be necessary. Now, in every family, after we have up all the things that are important in the budget, let's have a little bit of money for individuals to spend, the husband and the wife to spend, um, it has, whatever it, it, it might be, so that one does not keep on going to the other one, I need money for this, I need money for that. Let's have each one have individual expenditure that they can use to buy little things that they need. And this is after they've paid up for the main things in the house. Secondly, let us set a limit in our homes of what one person can spend without consulting the other. Let us not have this situation where somebody goes and say, surprise, I've just bought a new bedroom suit. Right? Um, I've got a friend of mine who, who did a surprise for his wife's birthday and bought her a car. And he had to return it three months later. Because surprises must be within budget. If you are going to do surprise, it must be within the limit for which you have agreed with your spouse. This you can spend without consulting the other. Let us not have surprises which gets the family into debt. And just get too much excited sometimes when you're in the shops. And then you say, oh, I want to buy this, I want to buy that. No, surprises must be within what you are allowed to spend without consulting the other person. Even if you're going to do a birthday party or whatever, let it be within the limit you've agreed. Otherwise, we're going to be people who find ourselves striding around and finding ourselves in debt. Live below your means. Now, most people live way above their means. You know, materialism encourages us to just buy things and do things and to impress people, even the people that we don't like. We, we keep on buying things. And, and, you know, television and all of those advertisements have got us going. They, they continue to make us buy and new things and new things. Now, you remember back in the day, there used to be those fat television, the cathode ray tube television, the fat ones. The very fat televisions. They've got things at the back the back of them, you know. And then, you know, and you know, we were watching those television, it was fine, you can see everything else there, the news and everything else. But then they came with plasma. And everybody decided that no, 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 the in thing is to buy plasma. So we went and bought plasma. 
And guess what? As soon as you bought plasma, they brought LCD. You ran to buy LCD, then they brought LED. And just after you bought LED, they brought smart TV. There is no end to it. They keep on getting you, you know, they make you feel less. You know, so many of us, because of, I know people in Zimbabwe, you know, like people back home in my, in South Africa, they're, they're just materialistic people. I'm sure you are good people here. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know how you know how it is. You know, um, back in, in my you know country, people they're competing. So you go there and you buy your new LED television, whatever, 67 centimeter, whatever it is, and then you know that they collect garbage on Thursday. So you buy it on Monday, but you want the neighbors because your neighbors don't usually get into your house. So what you do, you take out the box on a Monday and put it outside so that the neighbors can see. <laughs> because they will never know. How will they ever know that you bought an LED 67 centimeter? So you take out the box on a Monday so that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they can feel it. Yeah. That you've bought, you've come out of the fat television, you're now skinny. You, 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 know, you are now on diet. So, so you know, they, they must see. Now, after, you know, and then the neighbors see this thing and they notice it, they say, yeah, they get the message. Then on Saturday, for some of you, when they have gone to church, they go and buy a smart TV, 78 centimeter now. Now, just to sort you out, they take out the box on Saturday. <laughs> and it's going to run until Thursday. The whole week you'll be depressed. Because you, 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 suddenly your LED looks so small, you know, it looks so funny. But it, it is just marketing. These people have got us. These people have got us with their marketing. I just wish we can resist it. Because now I, you know, I don't have television, so I don't own a television, so, you know, so I don't really have sympathy. So they can't get it to me because I don't own a television, because I don't have time for such things. Now, the issue is, Oh, for those who don't want to know my reason, you can check on my website. I've got a blog where I've written 11 pages on why I don't watch television. Now, the issue is, the, 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 I have visited people with television. The ones which have got the fat ones, and the ones who have got the skinny ones. The news are the same, the same exactly. I mean, if it is South African news, they're still toitoying on the flat one, and they're toitoying on the... It is, it is just the same. I mean... It is just marketing that they got us. I just wish we can res resist that and live within our own means as people. Right. Wants and needs. Many people confuse needs as wants. A, a wants as needs. You know, we need to prioritize our needs and eliminate the wants. Many things we've got. You know, many, many ladies will go and see something and say, oh, this is 60% sale, 70% sale. I know I need that dress. No, a sale does not create a need. Right? It does not create a need. You will buy the dress at the right time, according to when you got budgeted for the time to buy. We get ourselves into that. Oh, yeah. And you know, people now, they've got this. You know, I don't know whether they've got the same thing here where you can buy on credit and, all, and so on and so on. Where... You get into things, you buy things you don't need just because they are on sale. I think we can eliminate that. The ability to sacrifice and to go without and to save and to be patient is a sign of maturity. You know, when we don't just run around and getting this and getting that and getting that, it shows that we are mature people. Saving saves. Save. We are told that we must save at least. Apart from 10% we give to God, let's have another 10% that we save of our, of, of our money so that we can help with the school kids, you university and, and so on and so on and so on and you know and be able to manage our lives now be be balanced and also enjoy life now after you have managed your finances well we're not saying don't enjoy the good things about life we're not saying don't have a good time we're just saying when you have a good time let's not be on debt it is beyond the money you've saved. So after you've managed it, your friends, well, you can have a little money. Maybe save a little thing, 200 rand or whatever, to buy pizza for the children, to do whatever. But, we are, but you can do that with a care conscience because you've saved and you've managed 
your finances well. Amen. All right. Let's continue with the next business of the day. The next. Let's have a song. Right? Let's have a song. Gentlemen, you can give us a song as we move on to the next item. and it says power or right to give orders make decisions and to enforce obedience God says he has given us authority power or right to give orders and to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all powers of the enemy <laughs> Some texts he also says I've given you authority over all diseases and sicknesses. God has given us right to give orders, right to enforce obedience. That's what God has given us today. And today we are about to pray, and I'd like to pray today for someone who is going through a difficult situation, someone who needs a miracle, somebody who needs power from above. Uh, it doesn't matter what the situation it can be, whether it's demonic, uh, torture of influences, whether it's witchcraft, whether it's financial problem, whether it's sicknesses, cancer, HIV, whatever it is, you say, Lord, I need power. I need a miracle. Tonight, God has given us authority over sicknesses and over all powers you see it's not that the devil does not have power he's got power he can he can run around at night maybe he can run around with a broom who cares whatever it is 
But what God has given us is given us authority even over power of the evil one. All power of the evil one. He has given us that authority tonight. That as God's people, we cannot be intimidated by the devil. In fact, he says power to trample upon the serpents and the scorpions. In fact, we need to tell the devil, devil, I can't fight with you. I can't box you. You belong under my feet or the sole of my feet. God has given us power to trample upon the devil. That's why we're more than conquerors. Because we don't fight him, we trample upon him. So we cannot be afraid. It doesn't matter what the devil is doing tonight. Whether he's attacked your family, whether he has attacked your, 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 your health, whatever the devil might be trying to do, we have authority tonight. We've got power. Power to enforce, to tell the devil to get out of this place, to get out of your life, get out of your marriage, get out of your family. God has given us authority tonight. To enforce obedience. And when we tell the demons, demons get out of this place. It is not your territory. God has given us that authority. And tonight we have come to claim that authority in the name of Jesus. Amen. The power that he has given us. So today it doesn't matter what it is. You are going through something. You said only a miracle. Only God can do this. You say, I, I want that authority to be enforced over my situation over my life, over my family, over my marriage, over my work situation, over my finances. Maybe you need a breakthrough, you need deliverance. Uh, God has given us that authority tonight. And I say you've come to the right place. You need a miracle. You need God to move in a mighty way. I'm not talking about small things. You, you know this is big. This is only God can do. This is not what a pastor can do, not what a human being can do, but only what God can do. So you are here tonight. You says, I need that miracle. I need that power. I need that power. I need God to move in a mighty way in my situation. And if ever that's your wish, I'll ask you to stand. All of us who need a special movement tonight. Uh, who, who need that authority to, uh, for the Lord to move and given unto you. And now you've given us authority over aspects of things here on this life. Even over all powers of the evil one. So here are your children today. We say, whatever the need has made them to stand. We pray, Lord, reveal yourself. Show yourself in a mighty way tonight. We pray for those who are tormented by demonic powers. For those who are tormented by witches and witchcraft. We say tonight, in the name of Jesus, deliver them. Deliver their homes. Make their homes out of reach for the devil and his demons. We pray in a mighty way today because you have given us the authority to heal the sick. We say tonight it does not matter what sicknesses it is that your children might have. It does not matter whether it's cancer, HIV, AIDS, high blood pressure, whatever it is. Lord, we Talking to a God who has got all power. We say, even now as we pray, move in a mighty way amongst your children. Move in the veins, in the organs. Even now, let them feel the movement of your Holy Spirit as you heal them and you make them whole. Lord, we pray. We pray for your children who tonight are struggling financially. We pray for those who are indebted. For those who keep on going deeper and deeper into hopelessness financially. Those who wonder tonight, how are they going to make through the next month? Lord, we pray to you who has got all power. You who say silver and gold is yours. We pray to you, say, Lord, tonight what we need is a miracle. We need a breakthrough because we realize we've been hitting against the wall. There is no way we are going one month after another. Lord, we pray, give us a breakthrough tonight. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our homes. You know the state of our homes. How the devil is ravaging some of our homes. How small houses are burning down our houses. Lord, we pray to intervene. Homes where communication is no more. Homes where there is no more intimacy. 
Homes where there is hopelessness and we are thinking of divorce. Some have already filed for divorce. Lord, we pray. We say you are a God who is able to restore. We say tonight, restore into our families every single thing that the devil has stolen. We claim in the name of Jesus, we turn back the clock from where the devil has taken things and bring back everything that the devil has stolen. Do it for us tonight. Do it for the name and to the glory of your name. Lord, you know different needs that are here. Some are looking for employment. Some are looking for business opportunities. We say, Lord, open doors. Open doors. But you are a God who doesn't only open doors. You are a God who can create new doors. We say, create new doors for your children today. Uh, let them, even tomorrow, as they wake up, as they try, as they reach out, let them find the doors ready for them. Do a miracle, Lord. We also like to pray in a special way for this great country of Zimbabwe. We pray that, Lord, you can prosper it. You know the challenges, you know the needs. We pray for the leadership. We pray from the president to all of those who are leading. May your spirit be upon them, guide them, and lead them to the path of prosperity for your children. Guide every single one of us and be with us because we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I hope there is no one who is offended by me reducing some of my colonial clothing. <laughs> Um, our message today is entitled True Worship, True Worship. Uh, for those who are joining us tonight for the first time, the train is moving quite fast. We have already started way back on Sunday and we are now moving at a high speed and we allow you to jump in. By God's grace, we pray the Holy Spirit can help you to catch with the moving train as we go deeper and deeper into God's word. Yesterday, we spoke about how it's all about love, that the kingdom of God is a kingdom based on love. It is, love is the basis of everything that God does. It, uh, he came to save us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. And that's why he came from heaven down to our level to come to save us because he loved us. He healed the sick and eventually he died on the cross because he loved us. That was the greatest manifestation of love. True love indeed. And, and, and because his kingdom is the kingdom of love, he, he then said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. He, he doesn't say if you fear me, he says, if you love me, our response to God's love is to keep his commandments. And we found out yesterday that the Bible says that all the law and the prophets hang on the two commandments of love. Loving God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and loving your neighbor as you love yourselves. We, we find out that, that all the laws and the prophets hang on that. We we spoke how we can summarize the whole Bible with the one commandment of love. And we realized yesterday that as much as we, in before, we, we might have denied, we say we won't obey, we won't follow what God says. But when we realize what Christ has done at Calvary, how he has loved us, we decide to follow him and to do his will. What is true worship? What is true worship. That's what we'll find out today. Our key text is found in Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. It reads, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth to every nation, tribe, 
tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the privilege you've given us today to hear your word. We come to thee, Lord, we say speak. Speak, Lord, as only you could. Speak to us. Some of us who are here for the first time. Lord, speak in the way that we will be able to understand you. Some of us will be hearing this message for the first time. Lord, find a way to speak to us. Speak to our lives. Speak to our families. Speak to our situations. Give us the ear to hear your message and the heart to receive your message. To that end, we pray that you might bless the reading and the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Angels in prophecy. Angels in prophecy means messengers. Messengers, they are those who have been sent. They have been sent and commissioned by God. These are messengers who carry the message that God wants us to know. John the Revelator was given the vision of what will happen at the time of the end. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it was given to John. He who is the Alpha and the Omega took John to the Omega part of history and let him see the details of things that will come to pass at the end. And John wrote as he was given the revelation by him who is Jesus, who himself is the revelator. John was shown that God will send three angels or messengers to prepare God's people for his second coming. To prepare his people for the coming. Our theme here says Jesus is coming. And John was shown that before he comes, there will be these three angels who will be sent to warn the people, to prepare the people about the coming of Jesus. Their message is the message of our day, the message of our time. Their message is the underlying theme of this revival because the revival says Jesus is coming and tonight I want us to focus on the message of the first angel. The Bible tells us in the text we've read something about this first angel. The Bible says he's flying in the midst of the air. The angel is not walking. The angel is not running. The angel is flying. The, the angel has got something urgent to communicate. So he decides that he's not going to walk. He's not going to run. He's not going to drive in a car. He flies in the midst of the air because the message is urgent. Everybody has to know, has to understand this message. The Bible tells us about this angel that he is an everlasting gospel, an everlasting gospel. He does not have a temporary gospel. You see, there are many temporary gospels that have come and gone. Uh, we, we've heard about the liberation theology, which is a gospel that is relevant to people who are oppressed. As soon as they, they, they get their liberation, that theology, that, uh, that gospel becomes irrelevant. Uh, we've heard about prosperity gospel. It, it is good for people who are poor. As soon as they get money and they prosper, it becomes irrelevant. There is a healing gospel for those who are sick, and it's only relevant when you are sick. But here, John talks about the everlasting gospel. Amen. It is a gospel that remains relevant throughout time and times and relevant in every generation and every age for everybody. This is the everlasting gospel. 
It says to preach to all who dwell on it. Uh, all means all. It says to preach to all who dwell on it. Uh, uh, all means all. It, it, it includes everybody. And that's why this gospel, even as we speak tonight, throughout the world, this gospel is being presented because this gospel has to be preached to all. All who dwell on it. If you are a citizen of this world, you've got to know this gospel. You've got to know this gospel. To, ev to, to every nation, tongue, kindred, and, 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 and people, everybody. It does not matter whether you are from Bulgaria or whether you are from uh, Zimbabwe or you are, you are from Kenya. Every people, everybody has to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody had to know. So, so this gospel is not for a, just a small group of people in one corner, uh, say only in Harare or whatever. No, this is a gospel that has to be preached to everybody because before Jesus comes back, everybody has to know what this message is all about. And then he says, he's saying with a loud voice, the, the, the angel is not whispering. He, he's not saying to just one or two people. He's saying with a loud voice because he wants everybody to understand the message, to know the message. So he's broadcasting it to everybody to get to know and to understand the message. What does the angel say? He says, fear God. <coughs> fear God. You know, too many of us are worried about what will the people say. I don't know whether you do the same here, but in back home they keep on saying, what will the people say? We are concerned. We are fearful of what the people say. Uh, we are fearful of their opinions. What will the deacons say if they find me? What will the elders, what will the pastors say? We are fearing the people. He says, no, don't worry about the people. Fear God. Fear God. God who, who sees you when you are in your little corner. When you have gone to the little place where you think nobody will ever find you. But there is a God who watches over you. Who sees you. Uh, a God who sees you when you have closed the room and, and nobody is there. But inside the room he sees you. Oh, this is a God who looks into your heart and sees the state of your heart. What you are thinking. Your thoughts. Fear God. Fear God who is going to bring everything, including every secret thing, into judgment. Fear God. Leave the people alone. We have come to the time and, and age where you just need to focus on God. You don't care what will the people talk about you, what they will say about you. You should be concerned, what will God say about me? Oh, what is God's opinion about me? What is his views about me? Fear God. The angel comes up and he realizes that last time that the most important thing is to be that of fearing God. And says, and give him the glory. Give him the glory. Stop taking the glory to yourself. Stop being so proud of who I am and what I have achieved, the positions that I have, and, and the things, my cars, my houses, my farm, my whatever. Fear God and give him the glory. At every time, every moment, look unto God and realize that if it wasn't for the Lord on my side, tell me, where would I be? Amen. Uh, give him the glory. Give him the glory of everything that he has done in your life and for you. Now it says, for the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment has come. It doesn't say it will come. It says it has come. It says the hour of judgment is here. It's here. You see, if you were still planning to do some little sin, it's too late for that. Because judgment is here. If you were still planning to have, to have a, a small house, too late for that. You should have done it last year. The hour of the judgment is here. It's too late. Judgment has come. You don't know I have a time because uh, Jesus might come while you are just driving towards the small house, going to the wrong direction. The hour of judgment is here. This is the time of judgment. And then, the key text of this message, the key part of this message says, Worship him. Worship him that made heaven and earth and sea 
and the springs of water. He says, the key message of the last days is that after you have feared God, after you have given the glory and, and realizing the hour of this judgment that is here, there is something that you must do while you are waiting for him. Worship him. Worship him. And, and, and now, he doesn't just say worship him. He describes who he is that you need to worship. Look around and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. We'll look into that in detail. What is worship? What is worship? Worship means to declare worth or to attribute worth. When we worship, we're saying that God has worth or that he is worth. That's what worship means. According to the Bible, there are three major types of kinds of worship. Worship that involves speaking. As I declare what that God is worthy. Worship that involves listening. As I, as I listen to his word. As I, as I hear what God says. And worship that involves doing. That my actions are in line with what God says. And when I do those actions, I'm worshiping God. Worship should not be confined to the church. It should be every time and everywhere where we are. As we walk down the road, as we, as we, as we do our work in, at, the, in, 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 at the workplaces, as we socialize with friends, every time we must be worshipping Him. Every deed, everything that we do must be worshipping God. All of life should be ceaseless worship. Worship is a continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I can ever become. It should be worship. As Christians, all that we do must be viewed in this view of worship. When we obey God's commandment, we are worshipping Him. We are saying you are worthy to be obeyed. We, we, we are just keeping His commandment is worship. Because sometimes we think worship is limited to say hallelujah and sing choruses. No, as I walk in the street and, 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 and there's some attractive woman crossing the street and if by God's grace I get the strength to turn my head to the other side I'm worshipping <laughs> that's worship right there whenever I obey God I, I, I'm worshipping him whenever I, I resist temptation uh, I'm worshipping God right there I, it's a praise and worship right there when I resist the little temptation that the devil brings when we are kind to others and friendly to strangers, we are worshipping God. Worship is not confined to things that we do. Now, the angel says, worship him because he is well aware. He is well aware that the war between God and Satan is over worship. The war between the Cosmic conflict we spoke about earlier in the week, it's all about worship. Isaiah 14, we, we, we read earlier in the week that Lucifer or Satan wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshipped. So he was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be worshipped. Worship is what started sin. It starts with worship. And that's why the angel is careful to say, worship him because why? He identifies who needs to be worshipped because the critical thing when we come to the end of time is who to worship. Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, whenever they were brought to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar says to them, I'm going to play some music. I'm going to put on some, some instruments. But if you fall down and worship the image which I have made, then that's good. But if you don't worship, you see, the devil always wanted to be worshipped. The key issue is for him to receive worship. Matthew 4, 9 to 10. After Jesus, the temptation, after he spent time uh, fasting, the devil comes to him and he says, All these things I will give unto you if you fall down and worship me. The key issue is worship. The devil just wanted to be worshipped. That's all that he desires, to be worshipped. And Jesus says to him, no, 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 my friend, no, no, no. You shall only worship the Lord God, your God, not you. 
Revelation 14, verse 9, the, the, the third angel says, If anyone worship the beast, now, we don't have time to go into that prophecy in detail, but the issue is, he talks about the beast, and the mark of the beast, and so on and so on. And he says, if anyone worship the beast and the image, the key issue, you know, people talk about the beast, they talk about the computer here and the whatever and the, and the barcoding and whatever. The underlying thing about the beast is worship. At the end of time, is whether you're going to worship God or you're going to worship the beast. Satan always wanted to be worshipped. Worship is the underlying issue. Now, in the text we have read, oh, in Revelation, talking about the mark of the beast, in Revel again in Revelation 3, 13 verse 4, it says, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is that? Now, so the issue is that at the end of the time, all the people who are going to be lost, there will be only two groups of people at the end of time. There will be one group that will worship the dragon and the beast, and there will be one group that worship him. Now, the issue that the angel wants to emphasize, he says, when I come to the end of time, I'm going to emphasize one thing. It's worship, and I'm going to tell you who to worship. Satan always wanted to be worshipped. Whenever he makes sure that people don't worship God, whenever he gets people to steal and cheat and commit adultery, that's the way to receive worship. Many didn't realize that when they have a small house, they're just worshipping the devil. Well, whenever he gets you to do such things, you see, he's pointing a finger on the eye of God and saying, look at them, they are worshipping me. They don't do what you say, they do what I say. All this of the way that the devil wants to be worshipped. All of life can be summarized on the question of worship. God wants to be worshipped. Satan wants to be worshipped. That's the whole issue. And that's why the angel says, worship him. Worship him. Now the question is, what makes our God worthy of worship? How does one choose between worshipping an idol and worshipping God? What makes you to choose God instead of a piece of idol? The answer is in the verse. It says, worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the spring of water. Of all the things, worship him. We worship God because he is the creator. That's what makes him worthy of worship. Because he created everything. That's what gives him the wealth to be worshipped. Revelation 4 verse 11. He says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. He says, that's why what, that's what you're worthy. Because you created all things. You're worthy to receive power and glory and honor. That's because you are the creator. The fact that our God is a creator sets him apart from all other gods. From the Hindu gods, the African gods, the Western gods. All of these other gods are creatures. They were created. But he's the creator. That's what sets him apart from all other gods. The mark of God's authority is that he's a creator. You see, what makes our God to stand out from all other is that he's a creator. He's the source. He's the one who creates everything else. All other gods, they are on the step lower. They are creatures. That's what makes our God. And that's why he says, worship him who created the heaven, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. True worship is acknowledging that God is the creator. That's true worship. What is the sign of his creative authority? What is the sign? Did God give us a sign of his creative power? Let's go back to creation. When he created everything. Did he leave us a sign way back then in Genesis? Starting in Genesis 2. Starting from verse 1. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and the host of them were finished. That's in six days. 
And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. Now, listen to this probably. On the six days, he creates all of those, the heavens and the earth. But on the seventh day, he does something else. On the seventh day, he ended the work. As if he doesn't end on the sixth. On the, he, 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 he creates everything, but on the seventh day, he, he starts, he do another day just to end. <laughs> on the seventh day, he ended. He, he, he says, let me do the day for ending. He ended his work that he has done. And he rested on the seventh day. And all his work, from all his work which he had done. Not only that, then he blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now, this is what is happening. God creates everything in six days. But then on the seventh day, he creates a day to end. So on the seventh day, he ends everything that he has done. But also, what he is doing on this particular day, he creates a day of a memorial of his creation. You see, he has already finished in six days, but he says, no, 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 I'm not already finished. I'm going to end on the seventh day. I'm going to end one more day. This day, it's a memorial of me creating everything. Now, what does it do with that day? The Bible says God blessed it. It's blessed. It, it is the day of ending. He blessed it. Uh, as if that was not enough, he goes back to it. It's almost like God goes and looks at the day. And he, he blesses it. He blesses it. And he walks two steps away. And he says, now, let me sanctify it also. He sanctifies it. And he looks and says, now, let me rest also. He, he, he keeps on going back to this to this day. This day, this one day, th there is no sun that has been created. There is no animal that has been created. It's just the rest that has been created. And he rested on this day. Why this day? A day. What is so important in a day? Does a day really matter? Should we be concerned about days, people ask us? Is not one day the same as any other? Is God particular about days? Is God concerned about days? Is he? Are we as people particular about days? Are we particular? Who says, ah, it doesn't matter, ah, it doesn't matter which birthday I have, I can have it in January. It just depends on when do I get my bonus, I can have it in January, I can have it in June, I can have it in December. Ah, it doesn't matter any day. We are particular about days. As a nation, we are particular about Independence Day. We never have the ah, no, no, we're going to shift Independence this year. You know, because of some other challenges we're having, we're going to shift Independence by a few months. We are particular about days. Those who are married, they're particular about anniversaries. Brothers, if you forget that day, you'll be in trouble. Do what I do. I put it on the phone and make it a reminder. Because, you know, we are men, we've got many things to worry about. <laughs> make sure that you remember that people are particular about days. Christmas Day. There's no way, even if the government can proclaim that, no, no, we're moving Christmas. To winter now, so that it becomes like American. You know, nobody would say, what? 25th of June, now, now it's Christmas. <laughs> we are particular about days. And in the same way, God is particular about days. In the same way, that's why he goes into a day. And, and, and he blesses it. Just one day. He doesn't do any other day. He, he blesses it, which means to invoke divine favor. The only day in the week that is going to bless it. I mean, I'm talking about people who are running low on blessing. That's a day to go into. Now, after blessing, he sanctified, which means to set it apart, to make it holy. And then he rested on it. Why will God rest? He never gets tired. But you know, I don't know whether you've seen parents when they teach babies to to talk, you know, they'll say, Mama, uh, Baba, whatever, if it is, back home. 
They talk like babies because they are teaching babies to talk. God rested because he had babies who will get tired, who will need rest. So he says, I'm going to rest with them to show them how they will need to rest for the rest of their lives as they get tired. Why? God is concerned that we might be misled and end up worshipping idols. He says, this day, because worship is only for a day who is a creator. So he says, I'm going to create one day that is a commemoration and remembrance that I am the creator. He says, that's why I'm going to create this day because I know people are going to mislead you to remind us that we are his children. A day. You see, if creation is a sign of God's authority, if who needs to be worshipped, it depends on the creator. Now, if the seventh day is a crowning act of his creation, if it is a day that God has put aside to make sure that everybody remembers that I'm the creator, because creation is important because it points us who to worship and it sets up a day to remind people that he's a creator. If God is particular and concerned about days, if it is so important that people should know and remember that he's a creator, how does God make sure that people never forget it? How does he make sure that they never forget it for the rest of their lives? He engraved it on a stone. He made it a law. You see, when God writes, you see, the woman who has caught in adultery, he comes, she, she comes up there and the man says, now we're going to kill her. And uh, Jesus starts writing on the sand. He starts writing on the sand, the sins of everybody. You know, you, you know you've got Margaret there. And maybe it's at the office and you've got... Uh, and he keeps on writing on the sand. When he writes people's sins, he writes on the sand so that the wind can blow it away. When he writes his law, he engraves it on a stone. Because the law is permanent. Your sins can be washed away when you repent. But, but, but the law remains permanent forever. We read yesterday. He says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away. But just only one thought or one title from the law to pass away. He engraves it with his finger on a stone. God wrote to endure forever. And what did he say? Look, listen to this commandment. The only one commandment that starts with remember. Because why? He knows that people will forget. He knows that people are going to be told other things. So he starts this commandment because it's nothing new. He wants you to remember that I'm the creator. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's nothing new. Remember. Remember. Remember because people are going to mislead you. Others are going to tell you many stories. Remember who your creator is. How do we keep the Sabbath day holy? It says, six days thou shalt labor and do all their work. On the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In that you must not do any other work. That's how you keep it holy. The reason is why. You see, right there the commandment, and many have not checked it out. Right there on the commandment. Why? Why the Sabbath? It gives you. In verse 11, it says, for, which means because. It says, because in six days the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Now it says, the reason why you must remember is because I'm the creator. Because this thing is only a commemoration, a remembrance, taking you back to, to, to Genesis. It's all about what I did then to remind people, I am the Lord your God. He says in six days, great heavens and then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He says, remember, that's the reason. That's the re There's no other reason. The reason why you need to keep it holy is because it reminds people who is the true God. Who needs to be worshipped. You see, if I had to summarize the first four commandments, the first one will say, thou shalt not have other gods before me. The second one will say, thou shalt not make grieved unto the agreement image. And the fourth, the third one will say, Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. And the fourth one will say, Thou shalt remember that the Lord is thy creator. 
That is all that the seventh commandment is, fourth commandment is all about. It's about reminding people. Why do they need to be reminded? Because there will come a time when they need to know who to worship. And when they know who, when they know who created them, then they will know who to worship. So the fourth commandment is all about reminding people who to worship and who is their creator. The origin of the Sabbath is the creator himself. Satan, because he wants to be worshipped. Listen to this. Because the devil wants to be worshipped. He, he was kicked out of heaven uh, because he wants to be worshipped. Because he wants to be worshipped. He attacked the fact that God is a creator. He doesn't want people to know. And we're going to talk about it just now. That's why he brings evolution. Evolution is an attempt to attack humanity. So that they must not know who their creator is. You see, if you don't know who your creator is, if you if we come to the big we come from a big bang, if if a monkey and a chimpanzee is my is my grandfather and my uncle, the issue is when I have stress and problems, I have no way to go to. But if I'm created by God, if He is the one who created me in His own image, when I have problems, when I have got challenges, I can go back to God and say, God, fix me. So the devil doesn't want people to know. That's why he brings evolution. He doesn't want people to know who their creator is. He attacks the fact that God is a creator. And then he attacks the institution that God created to remind us who is the creator. Now, I know we do have a... Um, I imagine, there, we do have monuments here in, in, in Harare, right? Um, where we've got, uh, what do they call it? Um, the statues of people who fought in the struggle, right? And, and so on and so on. Why do we have those? They are there to remind us, it's a monument to remind us that these people fought for us during the struggle. Now, God created the Sabbath day to remind us as a monument of remembrance that I created you. So the devil attacks that. He attacks that monument. He wants it to be destroyed so that nobody knows where they come from. Satan says we are not created, but we are a product of chance. We come from evolution. That we started off like little monkeys. And we continue to develop until we learn how to walk. That's why this teaching is in the curriculum of every school. It's there in our television. They are told about billions of years. The devil wants to make sure we do not know that we've got a creator. Who fashioned us in his own image. Now look again. In the Ten Commandments, the law that states that God is a creator is the one that the Satan attacks more than any other. The fourth commandment is attacked by more than any other one. So the devil does not like, he put the spotlight on the fourth one. You see, the fourth commandment is under attack by both believers and unbelievers. Why? The devil does not want that law. He doesn't want people to know that they were the creator whom they must worship alone. So he keeps on attacking and attacking that very same commandment. The attack on the 10th commandment is basically the attack on the 4th commandment. Now you have heard people say, that, ah, no, 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 we don't have to keep the commandments. The commandments are done away with. You know what they mean? They only mean one commandment. Yeah. They only mean the 4th commandment. Yeah. When they say, when you hear sometimes a preacher who's a little bit confused, who says that the commandments are done away with, you don't have to keep them. He means only one. Because I asked the preacher, now that you say the commandments are done away with, is it okay for me to come and steal the piano in your church? Because the commandments are those thou shalt not steal doesn't apply anymore. Is it okay for me to start having Mam Fundisi as my small house? Is it okay? Because thou shalt not commit adultery. It's not over there. Quickly, the pastor said, no, 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 you can't commit adultery. No, you can't steal. 
So, when you say the commandments are done away with, what do you mean? They only mean one commandment. They only want, mean one commandment, which is the fourth commandment. That's the only commandment. Why? Because the devil doesn't like the commandment. He, he doesn't mind us following all others, as long as we don't know who is our creator. As long as we don't know who is worthy of worship. And the monument that he has created. He says, no, 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 uh, run around, do everything else, but not this. The fourth commandment is under attack. And this is why the angel back in Revelation, it says to us, worship him who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the space. Worship him. Go back. That's why. The angel is particular. The first angel that God sends has to take people back to God because the commandment that God has done is under attack today. Because it reminds us that we're created by God in six literal days, that we're not billions of years old. We Six days God created. You know, sometimes when people, I listen on television, people say, oh, this world is billions of years old. You know, I don't complain. I say, Amen. They say, no, there were millions and millions. I said, amen. Because whatever the world in their own imagination will take billions of years, God does it in six. <laughs> so why should I complain? I mean, I mean, uh, uh, it just shows the greatness of my God. It, it just shows how powerful he is. You know, I don't know where it is, Dr. Chimoka here. But you know, I mean, they are doctors. And with all their profession and everything else that they do, if a patient comes today with whatever sickness, they, they, they will say, now take this for the next two, three weeks, you'll get better. But my God, you touch the hem of his garment right there. Immediately. A, a, a lame person, a, 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 my, my good doctor and others, we're going to do operations and try to see how the bone can join it and whatever else. God says, rise up and walk. You see, with that kind of God, I have no problems when they say billions and billions of years. I said, okay, amen. You've got the point. That's my God. He would blow your mind. You can't think what he can do. <laughs> no, no, no. It reminds us in days and sisters, because it exposes the devil lie on evolution. It tells us that's a lie. Why does he attack us? Because it points us to who to worship. It leads us to true worship, which is the worship of the Creator. Matthew 15, verse 19. But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. God says, in vain are you worshiping me. If you are teaching the doctrines of men, the doctrine that doesn't come from me, it's a waste. He says, true worship is not just shouting and dancing. True worship is obedience. True worship is going back to what God has said. And he said, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath is a sign that we worship him exclusively, that we love him supremely. It's a sign of true worship. That's why he says, in Ezekiel 20 verse 12, he says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be the sign between them and me. He says, I've given them to be a sign. To be these people are the ones who worship me, who worship him. This is a sign. Look around. That's the sign. Ezekiel 20 verse 20 says, Keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I'm the Lord your God. He says again, when you do that, it becomes a sign. So I've given you a sign. I, I've given you a sign to say you, you, you are the one who, okay, who understands me, who feel me, who know who I am, who connects with me. That's a sign. What is a sign? It's a sign that you worship Him, who created the heavens and the earth. Did Jesus follow true worship? Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Matthew five seventeen. He says, "Do not think." That I came to, to destroy the law and the process. Don't think about it. Please, don't, don't think about it. It's not okay. Don't even think about it. I didn't come to change the law and the process. I came to fulfill. I came to show you how to do it. 
Jesus kept the Bible Sabbath. Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on and as his custom was. Now, I like the Bible. See, the clarity of the Bible is beyond anything I can think about. Just because somebody was going to say, ah, you know, he came to Nazareth and then he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He says, no, people will think it just happened because his friends were going there. He says, no, as his custom was. He says, now, this is not just an occasional thing. It is what he does. You see, if I'm calling myself a Christian, uh, it's the one who acts and behaves and talks and follows Jesus. A Christian must have the custom of Jesus. So if I'm following Jesus, I must follow his customs. Instead of the custom of my ancestors, I follow the custom of Jesus. Mark 2 verse 28. It says, therefore the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. When he says the Lord, it means he says I'm the president of the Sabbath. People have been trying to, you know, these Jews had come there and said, ah, you know, somebody whom you healed, he picked up the thing and, and he, he broke the Sabbath. He says, do you know who I am? I'm the CEO of the Sabbath. I created this thing called the Sabbath. Back then, they would, so you're going to tell me, you're going to teach me. Oh, you're going to teach me how to keep the Sabbath. You don't know nothing about the Sabbath. Let me teach you. That's when he continued, verse 28. To tell them, the Sabbath I created it then for man, not for the Sabbath. The man was not for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for man. He says, when I rested then, I was teaching my babies how to rest because this I'm doing for the Sabbath, for the, for the man. So you don't, don't think you can tell me about the Sabbath. I'm the president. I'm the CEO of the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of it. The Sabbath is God's gift to the entire human race. That's what he says in verse 27, Mark 2, 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He says, you, you, you don't understand it, you don't understand it. I just did it for, for, for men so that they can rest and whatever. You know, and you know, in my home, when the Sabbath starts on Friday evening, it is the best time ever. It is the best time to ever uh, to be with the family. Any other day does not become as wise and nice and wonderful as the Sabbath evening as I start to rest with my family. If you love me, keep my commandments that we had yesterday. What should happen on the Sabbath day? How do you spend the day? Leviticus 23 verse 3. That's the only verse you're going to find in the Bible which tells you on which day to worship, to go to church. It says, there are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. Another version it says of holy convocation. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is the Sabbath of the Lord. And so when you say it's a day of rest, it says it's a day of holy com it's a day of going to church. That's the only verse you're gonna find in the Bible which tells you the day to go to church. It says this is the day of holy convocation. <coughs> That's what must happen. The Sabbath is an appointment, it's a date with God, it's, it's a rest from all. We spend time with God. It's time when God recreates us. It's God says, Come out so that you can chill with me, have some time with me. How can we know which day is the Sabbath day? How do we know which day is the Sabbath day? We go back when Christ was crucified. It was on a Friday. We, we still celebrate Good Friday. Um, it was on a Friday afternoon when, when, when Christ was crucified. And Luke 23, when we read from Luke 23, verse 59, all the way to 24 and verse 1, it says, That day was the preparation. It says that day. It's according to the Jews, Friday is a day of preparation, preparing for the Sabbath. It says that day was the preparation. And the Sabbath drew near. That's the day when Jesus Christ died. So the Sabbath drew near. Now it's, listen to what the Bible says. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Okay? Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrance. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. I love the Bible. These were the disciples of Jesus. They knew if the commandments were done away, they were not going to rest according to the commandment. He says, so Sabbath was, it was Friday, the Sabbath, it was preparation, the Sabbath doing here, on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. When you go to verse 24, verse 1, it says, and on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So, so what do we find here? Friday was a day of preparation. They went to see where he was laid. 
on Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. That Saturday and Sunday on the first day, they went to the tomb where they found his result. I walked together. So, the Bible tells us exactly the point which day is the Sabbath day. As the world turns, God has made sure that we keep on remembering that he is a creator. He give us this memorial that as we go from Sunday, the first day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we can have the seventh day. And the day that God has anointed. That as the day stands, Monday, Tuesday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it becomes the Sabbath day. It keeps on rotating to remind us which day it is to worship God, which day in which to come to God and to give Him the glory. Did the disciples of Jesus follow the true Sabbath? Did they keep the Sabbath? Acts 17, verse 1 to 2. And they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went in, into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. It was Jesus' custom, it was Paul's custom. And it is my custom. Amen. Acts 13 verse 42. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word. They were moving from one Sabbath to another. Six, Acts 16 verse 13. Even now when they were out of the synagogue, when they were being persecuted, it says, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So even if there was no synagogue, it was not just because of the synagogue when there were the Jews. Even though there was no synagogue, they went down to the river to worship there. Revelation 14, 12, 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. When we come to the end of the time, it says, John is shown people are going to be saved. It says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They don't keep the commandments of God to be saved. No, it is the faith of Jesus that saves them and then they keep his commandments. We spoke about yesterday that you cannot be saved by keeping commandments. You cannot be saved by keeping the Sabbath. You can only be saved by Jesus and his blood. And when you are saved by Jesus, then you must keep the commandments. In the new Jerusalem, are we going to follow the true worship? Are we going to keep the Sabbath in the new Jerusalem? All of us want to go to heaven. What will happen in heaven? Are we going to be keeping, acknowledging God as a creator? Isaiah 66, verse 22 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Amen. So in heaven where we are trying to go to, the Bible says from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship him. And that's why today we are preparing people to go to heaven. Because Jesus is coming again. And as he's coming again, we need to prepare people who comply, not to what the world says, to comply to what heaven says. So what we're going to be practicing in heaven, we might just as well practice here today. And this is what God wants to prepare. The first angel says, fear God and give him the glory. Worship him. Worship him. The Sabbath was created at Sinai. Was created, was given at, at creation. Given again at Sinai. Kept by his people. Kept by Jesus. Honored by the disciples. A sign of God's power. Kept in the new earth. And when we shall be saved, that's where we shall be. God is the creator and what is true worship? True worship is worshiping the Creator. God has given us a day which is blessed and sanctified, an appointment with Him, a day to rest from all our labor, which is a sign that we belong to Him, a day to keep to remind us that He created us, and it is the seventh day, Sabbath day. But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of 
spirit god is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth so god does not just want us to worship him in spirit in excitement but we must worship him in the truth also we need to know the truth and that's why you know i know the audience here tonight is intelligent and god says come let's reason together let's reason with the truth and this is the truth as we find it in god's word for some of us, there are many of us who have been Christian for a long time. And this particular message comes up as new, but it has always been in God's word. It has always been there. And, you know, God has walked with you and you have seen miracles, you, you have seen answers to prayers, and you, you know that your experience with God is real. God has blessed you. He has answered your prayer. And it is no surprise that God has led you here tonight. God, you see, the Bible says, the path of the just shines brighter unto the eternal day. God in his own mercy has taken you one step at a time. And he brought you here tonight because he knew you were ready. You know, he says, other sheep I have that are not in this crawl. He knew you were ready to take another step higher. You see, the Bible says, the truth, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Set you free from the lies of the devil. Set you free from obeying what man says. So I know there are many here today. Faithful Christians who didn't know this truth, but God has entrusted them tonight to say, I want you to know this truth because you are special to me. I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. And it is for those that God has, you know, maybe the preacher might not have been very gentle in his speech, but I know God's voice has been gentle, pointing you step by step that this is the truth. This is the way to go. And there are many here tonight, I believe, who says, we are prepared to take God at his word. We are prepared to follow him. The word says, fear God, give him the glory, worship him who created heavens and earth. And we found out today, God has got a memorial to remind us every week that he's a creator and that we're created in his image. And today there are many who say, no, we want to follow the true creator. We don't want to follow what man says. We want to follow what the Bible says. We want to worship him, only him, for he is worthy. And as we're about to close, I would like to invite you to stand. All of us who say, we want to worship him alone. Him who created the heavens and the earth. We want to follow his commandments. We want to keep his Sabbath. We want to do his will. We want to be reminded every week that he is a creator. We want to follow his word. Not what man says, but what the Bible itself says. So all of us, who is our decision to follow God and God alone, and to obey his commandments, and to do as Jesus did, and as his disciples did, to follow the true worship. I'll ask you to stand as we pray together. All of us who say we want to follow God and do his will and, and follow him and do only what he desires us to do. And there are some of us I know tonight who are taking this decision for the very first time. And I know the devil does not like that. He doesn't like us to, to follow the truth and to do God's biddings. And tonight I want to pray especially for you. He says, I know the truth. I, I might not know how I will take it from here onwards, but I just need the Lord to guide me. I, I've heard the truth and I can see it's clear. I just want the Lord to, to guide me to follow me. As much as he has guided me up to this far, I want the Lord to guide me in my steps going forward. So all of us who says, I need that special prayer. I want from this day onwards to be guided by God. I've made this decision for the first time and I want the Lord to guide me 
as I take the step forward, as I go forward, I want the Lord to order my steps. And all of us who are decision to say, we're taking this for the first time. We want to start to follow this journey. And we want the guidance of the Lord. I want to ask you to raise up your hand. Just raise up your hand wherever you are. You need a special prayer. You're making this decision for the first time. I'll ask you to just raise up your hand wherever you are. I want to pray for you. Making decision. I see you, the hands there. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. All of you who are, yes, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. Those who are making decisions. I'll, I'll ask so that, I'll ask us to come forward here. All of us with our hands up to come here. Uh, no, we don't fear people. We fear only God. Let's come here. I want to pray for you. All of us who says we're making this decision for the first time today. Just come right here. Uh, we want a special prayer. I want you to come forward right here. Right now as we as we're about to pray. All of us. All of those with their hands up. You want to join in. You, you, you are there. You say, I've heard this message. Today is the first time. I want to follow through. Come. Come right now. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is moving. He's talking to your heart. He's telling you this is the right thing to do. Come right now. The Holy Spirit is here. He said, you want a special prayer. I want to walk with Jesus. I want God to bless me in the decision that I have made. I, I, I want to do His will. I don't care what a man says. I don't care what my friend says. I don't care what my brother says. My family members, you are still there. I know there are many in the value of decision. They are still there who are still... Oh no, you need to come up here. And the Spirit of God is moving. He's, he's talking to your heart. He says, you need to do this decision. You need to follow Him. You want to be guided by Him to go all the way. You come right now as we're about to pray. You say, Lord, guide my steps. I've heard the truth. It's clear. I know it is the truth of God. And I want to follow you. I want to do only what you want me to, to do. And if ever that's your decision, come as, as we are about to pray. We don't want to labor this longer. But if ever you are there, you say, Holy Spirit, guide me. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know you have got the power to guide me. You led me to this message today because you know I was ready and I'm ready to follow you. To follow only what you say. If ever the Spirit is still moving you, we we'll want you to come through. If ever the Spirit is still moving you, we don't want you to waste much of your time. But if ever that's your wish to do what is um, the Bible is saying, come through as we are about to pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to come before thee tonight. Lord, here are your children who have come forward. They have come forward to take this giant step of faith. The giant step of faith to do your will, to follow you. They have heard your voice. It's a familiar voice. The voice that they've heard before leading them and guiding them in their lives. And Lord, they are ready to take one more step higher. Lord, we just want to pray that you can seal their decision. Oh, don't let no devil, no demon turn them around. Hide them under your blood and walk with them from this day onwards until that day when you shall come in the clouds of the skies. Lord, be with your people. Be close to them. As others try to discourage them, give them courage. Be with us, Lord, and we pray. There are many of us who are standing to renew our commitment to you and to follow you and to choose you to obey you oh lord strengthen us there are some of us who are also making the decision for the first time but maybe we're not ready we're a bit afraid to come forward lord you can see our hearts we say lord give us no rest until we follow the truth that you have planted in our hearts some of us just stop by here for the first time and this truth is a bit shocking to us. Oh Lord, we pray, even as we go to sleep, harass our mind, clarify the truth and bring us back tomorrow with a decision to go all the way with you. This world is coming to an end. The angel is warning his people to worship him. Be with us today and Bless each and every one of us. <coughs> Give us traveling messages. We shall go to our respective homes and 
bring us again tomorrow as you have got another message, powerful message to encourage us and to strengthen us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I long to be part of those who will be saved at last, to be part of the saints of the Lord. With my voice I shall shout as I cross to yonder shore. What a bright and blessed day. They'll be singing, singing your river by the reading of the Lord. Join the chorus of the reading on the bright and golden shore. Evangelizing.